welcome to my July reading wrap up. I read a total of five, almost six books during the month of July and also put down several books. I have been fighting off a reading slump, like my life depends on it. So I'm trying a few different things and I'm also realizing that because I'm trying a lot of different things, it means I'm not settling. So something about what is happening is a reading slump. Usually around this time of year, like July, August, I'm getting into a reading slump anyway. And usually I'm participating in the magical readathon, which has a whole bunch of complicated prompts, which is very motivating to try and get your to be read pile to fit all those prompts so that you can finish a whole bunch of books and pass magical subjects by finishing books in a magical school. So because that readathon is going ahead, I think I'm going to be a little bit more motivated come August. But we're talking about July, so let's get into my reads. I did a few rereads this month, which really helped keep some of my ratings higher. One of those rereads was An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green. This is a science fiction set in our world and it's about April. She's a recent college graduate. She's working this job that requires a lot of her. And so one night she's walking home at like three o'clock in the morning from this job in New York. And she walks past this huge statue and she's like, this is an incredible art installation. I can't believe as an artist, I almost walked past this and didn't appreciate it. And so at like three o'clock in the morning, she calls her friend Andy and goes, we need to make a YouTube video about this because he has a YouTube channel. So he reluctantly gets out of bed, makes this YouTube video with her, and then they post it and go to sleep. And when they wake up, April's girlfriend, Maya, is like, have a coffee, don't check your phone. And it turns out that the statue that April found is a statue that has popped up in every city in the world overnight. And it's basically the inciting first contact with Alien story. And it launches April into fame and glory, but it comes with a price. And that is putting herself forward as a person who becomes her brand. And it's a really interesting discussion and a very detailed discussion about parasocial relationships, social media and the internet and how we perceive people and things. I just found it incredibly fascinating and I loved how the characters interplay in this story. So of course I gave it five stars and I loved the performance of the audiobook. So I would recommend listening to it if you can. Then I had a few different reads in between, but I may as well talk about these two books together for obvious reasons. So I also read A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor, which is the sequel book to An Absolutely Remarkable Thing. And this is a duology. Both books are obviously out, so you can go and smash them out like I did. This again, I listened to an audiobook and I really enjoyed it. It obviously continues the story in book one straight into book two with about four months gap in between. And this one again focuses on those themes of your own ideology, the internet and advertising and how we are always succumbing and exposed to advertising. And it was a very in-depth discussion on how media can infiltrate your life in the sense that there was a quote that says our reality isn't what's real, it's what we pay attention to, which can really be influenced by the advertising that we consume. And if we become this corner of the internet and we're exposed to those videos and that content, then we can easily spiral into that corner. And so it was an incredible look at, well, this is how people start to become extremists because they're spiraling this way and that way because of the content that they consume and then is reinforced to them on the internet. It was incredibly fascinating. And I love the themes in this book. Although I did speak about this very briefly in my most recent reading vlog. And I think that the themes overtook the story a little bit in this one compared to the characters taking up the forefront. Not to say that the characters were depleted in any means. I still gave this a five stars. I love this duology and that's why I reread it to see if I still loved it and I do. And I felt that in book one, the characters were very much front and center because it relied on them setting your foundations to push these themes forward. But now obviously book one has been set up all these characters you know, so it can push more of the themes and the journey through the plot. So it made me feel not as deeply, still deeply, but like not as much as book one. And so it was really valuable reading about these themes again, given that it's a nice reminder to have when you're consuming so much YouTube, Instagram and Twitter content, you're like, hang on, I need to take a step back. So this was a really great way of looking at my own habits. And I think it's a really important book to read for the themes, but also it's just a great story and it's very enjoyable. Then I was like, I feel very slumpy because I've reread the things that are familiar to me. I don't feel like wrapping my head around massive complex fantasy books. So I was like, what can I do? So as a palate cleanser, I went to Tessa Bailey and I read the first book in the Hot and Hammered series called Fix You Up. And this one is about Georgie. She's the youngest sibling of the castle family and the castles buy houses, renovate them and then flip them. And 
because she doesn't really associate herself with that family business, she's gone and she's kind of started to build her own business, but she's literally a clown that goes to people's houses for their kids' parties. And so she's viewed literally as like a joke and not taken seriously. And also because she's the youngest, she's like, I want to strike out on my own and actually be taken seriously because I do mean business. And then her love interest is Travis and he had an injury in baseball and he's slowly recovering from that. And Travis was one of the best friends of George's older brother. So that's how they know each other. They know each other from childhood. So it's almost like they've got this loose understanding of each other based on their childhood, but now they're coming together as adults and realizing that there have been a lot of shifts and changes, but they've also got that nostalgia for each other as well. So I really liked seeing their relationship unfold, but it's a story that's just easily digestible and then there's smut and then there's an ending that's why i read it i knew that there was a formula i knew that it would be easy to like these characters if they communicated enough but the frustrating parts in any romance novel usually i can kind of sideline them in this one though the characters knew each other like they'd had that history and they kept sabotaging themselves just by self-doubting and then not talking about it. And that's kind of a form of miscommunication, I guess. Tessa Bailey really relies on miscommunication in her books. And depending on how heavy handed it is, sometimes I'm like, I can't do this. And so I gave this about a three, three and a half stars. It was enjoyable. I could get past like the miscommunication in terms of self-sabotage. But what can I say? I like the trope of fake dating and I like how these characters built their relationship together. They had a lot of chemistry. The book ended quite abruptly. I don't know. There were pros and cons for this story. I just liked it. And I continued on with the Hot and Hammered series, somewhat to my chagrin because the second book, Love Her or Lose Her in the Hot and Hammered series is about Rosie and Dominic and they are a married couple and they've been living together for four years and they have not really spoken to each other at all and I'm like this is peak miscommunication I put it down after 17% because I'm like I can't do this anymore but the point I got to in the story was the characters deciding to go to therapy because they thought there was obviously more problems under the surface than what they'd initially realized so at least I kind of know it goes in the direction of therapy, which is what I was like screaming about in my own head when I started this book. I'm like, clearly there is a problem here. Like one of you was in the army and has come back and your personality is decidedly different from when you left. So something has occurred maybe go to therapy. So at least they kind of went down that road, but I just couldn't stand them as characters. They seem to rely so heavily on miscommunication and I hate that as a trope. So I was like, I can't do this. Speaking of which, I did another did not finish or DNF this month and that is The Black Tongue Thief, which I'm so disappointed to have put down. I got 50 pages into this. And it had such great ideas and the humor of the story was really coming to the forefront in its narration, but it felt like it was doing too much at the same time. It felt like too much was being juggled. And because too much was being juggled, you get a bit of information that you could be interested in and then it would divert a whole bunch of things. And so you lose the thread that you started with and then you lose your interest. So I was like, I don't find myself caring about this story. I did start to appreciate some of the world building, but like I said, it was very diluted. It seemed like the protagonist was bordering on that rogue quality with a sense of humor, but it seemed very blase at the same time. So I thought I could like this, but it's not quite right. I just don't vibe with this writing style. So I got 50 pages into this one and I'm like, I need to call it quits. Otherwise it's gonna put me into a reading slump. Then I picked up a sequel to a book that I absolutely loved. So the sequel is Parable of the Talents by Octavia E. Butler. And Octavia E. Butler usually writes sci-fi dystopian stories that are incredibly thematically relevant to our modern day, despite being written like 30 years ago, which is terrifying, but incredibly smart. So when I picked up Talents, I was like, I love the first book. I can't wait to get into this one. And this one is set four years after the events of the first book. And the first book really wrapped up everything about the character's situation. So it felt very satisfying to just read as a standalone, which I would recommend doing. This book focused on the religion that the main character had come up with in book one called Earthseed. It really relied on telling you truths about the world, but speaking of God at the same time. So like if anything bad happened, it wasn't necessarily religion as a comfort. It was a religion as a reality, like God is change. So I guess embracing change and understanding it as part of your own life because the life that 
all of these characters are living is in a very dark world. So that's where the dystopian nature of the story comes in. And the followers of Earthseed are starting to be viewed as a cult and so they have outward threats against them. There was a trope in here that I just don't like which is the pregnancy trope that occurs in a dystopian book. I was like I don't like it. It didn't seem to be as much of a problem as I initially thought it might be because it happens at the very beginning of the story. So it didn't impact it negatively overall and there were also some characters that felt like they were at odds and it didn't feel like it was a very well woven together story. It felt very haphazard. So in my reading vlog recently I said that when I was reading it I would often tear up over some things and then at a different storyline I would just completely disassociate. So because it was that kind of oscillating story it didn't feel very satisfying in the resolution and I didn't care about all of the characters overall and where they ended up or how they interacted. I lost a lot of that feeling in book two whereas I was very connected in book one. So that's why I only gave this one a three stars. It wasn't really what I hoped it would be either. So you never want to follow up a book that was five stars with the sequel being three. Anyway, it wasn't terrible. It just was really undercut to my expectations and I'm really wishing that I just stayed with book one. Then at my library, I was like, I don't know what to read next. I've had so many up and downs. So I was like, I'm gonna try the subtle art of not giving up. And I got like 10% in and I was like, I don't give up. And I stopped reading it. Happiness is a struggle is one of the main quotes. And you know, Generally as a concept, I would agree it's sometimes hard to notice that we are happy or make ourselves happy because we are really plugged into that productive culture. And again, going back to an absolutely remarkable thing, the duology, understanding our connection to social media and how that is influencing us through advertising in our own ideology really links into this sense of our own well-being and happiness and how we feel like we are living our lives. Our happiness isn't tied to productivity. I get it, but the way that it was written felt very almost blasé, somewhat dismissive and sometimes preachy a little bit, which is a hard thing to kind of find a balance with given that you're in that space of writing a self-help book. Like I'm sure a lot of them feel preachy. So maybe that was me just with a chip on my shoulder. Maybe that was the way this book was written. I don't know. A lot of people seem to like this one, but I just couldn't do it. So I put it down. But then I needed a shake up. And so I picked up Robin Hobb. If you don't know by this point, I absolutely love Robin Hobb, but I haven't read her for like 15, 10, 15 years. And I'm like, I need to reread her books because this is an incredibly emotive story and it follows Fitz. He's the bastard son of Prince Chivalry and Prince Chivalry is the king in waiting, but he defects from the throne when he realizes that he's got this scandal connected to him with Fitz. And Fitz is kind of taken under the wing or forced under the wing of Burridge, who is Chivalry's right-hand man. And Burridge is the stable master. So he looks after all of the horses and the dogs and everything. So he helps raise Fitz and Fitz starts learning about the castle and the politics and all of the underground things connected to the royal line and preserving their image. And it's a brilliantly unfolding story because you're learning from Fitz's point of view. And so everything that you understand is a whole scope of the castle. Fitz only has a young kid's understanding of things at the beginning. And you'd think that would be annoying, but it actually kind of goes into that cozy fantasy territory because I felt like I was seeing through Fitz's eyes and growing up in Buckkeep Castle. This was incredible. And I actually get chills when I talk about this book because I'm so emotionally invested in everything that is happening. And I think it's important to note also that even though this isn't a very long fantasy book, it took me a while to read. Like it took me almost three weeks. And usually I would smash through a book like like this in maybe a week, even sooner potentially as an audiobook. But with Robin Hobb, her writing can't be rushed. And if you try and rush it, you don't get the emotive value from settling in and reading it. So I would caution you against trying to pick this up and rush through it because you can't read it quickly. You need like little chunks of time that you can dedicate to unfurling and unwinding into the story. I cried four times reading this book and I absolutely love it with all my heart. It's just amazing. And I'm back on my Robin Hobb train and I have no regrets, except for the emotionally wounding part. Like, because you're so connected and close to the characters, anything that happens, you're just like, whew, I feel that in my heart and my soul and my bones. <laughs> 
So it's just, yeah, it's just amazing. But I also have one more book to talk about. And that book is the third book in the Hot and Hammered series by Tessa Bailey. I literally have 30 minutes left of the audiobook and I didn't finish it before this wrap up. So you can tell that I'm only mostly invested in it, not completely. I probably give it about a three stars. This one follows Bethany and she is the oldest sibling of the Castle family. And she's involved in this family business of buying and flipping houses, but she's only involved in the last aspect, which is designing the interior of the house before it's put on market. And she's like, I want to be more involved in the family business. It feels like my brother, who is lead of all the projects, doesn't take me seriously and doesn't trust me. And to be fair, he's a very condescending character and he's very frustrating to read about. So I can understand why she would be annoyed with him. So she's like, I'm going to strike out on my own. And one of the construction workers who works under Bethany's brother is like, I'll come and help you. And I think they got introduced in book two, but because I skipped book two, I didn't see their initial rapid fire, almost argumentative and sparks flying interaction. So I'm only getting book three's worth of their story, but honestly, it's enough to just like piece things together anyway. So I wasn't too bothered about that, but his name is Wes and Bethany is 30 and Wes is 23. And Wes has gone through multitudes of foster care growing up. And he's also been given the responsibility of looking after his five-year-old niece, Lara, because his half sister is in and out of doing drugs. And so she's not in a great place and you get to see him understanding his fears but not letting them affect him too much and then you see Bethany trying to make everything in her life perfect and so between their very humorous banter they kind of ground each other and it's really nice to see and unlike the other two books that have miscommunication fairly consistently through them this one's actually pretty decent like these characters are forming a foundation of trust and they're talking to each other and they're talking themselves out of their spirals and trusting each other with the vulnerable parts of each other and to me that's what a relationship is if you're going to be vulnerable with anyone it's with your partner and that's what this story is really like hitting home about i'm hoping that the last 30 minutes don't just completely derail entire books worth of building up to that moment but i hope it won't if it does i'll put a pinned comment in or something and say that i I hated it. <laughs> I don't think I'll hate it though. Like it's sitting at a solid three stars. It's enjoyable. It's very smutty. So I guess that's my wrap up. Stay tuned for my reading vlogs for the Magical Readathon. Let me know what you're reading during the month of August. I'll link my to be read list with you as well. But thank you so much for watching this video. I'll come chat to you down below in the comments. I'll see you in my next video and I hope you're not getting into a reading slump. Let's all fight them off.